Hello again, hope you're all doing well. Each year I do an unannounced one-off on something or anything that interests me, and today I'm covering the recent failed class action lawsuit and why its goal of inserting unfitness in place of best interests as a custody standard doesn't work. So, if you didn't know, just this month a class action lawsuit by nine California parents was thrown out of federal court. These are nothing new. I covered why they fail a few years ago. And most, to be frank, are very hard to take seriously, like this billion-dollar lawsuit the father's rights movement hyped up a few years ago, a crayon-scribbled mess that never made it past the e-file stage. Most of these lawsuits try to sue the family judge in federal court for having the temerity to rule against them. Thankfully, judicial immunity, which acts as a shield, inhibits most of these kind of off-the-wall lawsuits from going very far. But to get around that judicial immunity, those nine parents sued the chair of the California Judicial Council, alleging she failed to properly train her judges, and had they been properly trained, the parents would have gotten better outcomes in their cases. Now, is their theory that before a judge can allocate visitation or decision-making among the parents, they must first make an unfitness finding, despite the fact that every state and territory determines custody on a best interest basis. Regardless, they filed their class action under a specific proviso of Section 1983, which is the federal statute that allows redress for civil rights violations for things such as like police brutality or inhumane prison conditions. And in their view, because the courts follow what's actually written in the law, as opposed to what the parents believe should be in the law, their rights were violated. Now, as you can sense, I'm gonna be a bit critical here, and, but here's why. That's Todd Phillips, the attorney running this lawsuit, and he was hyping this thing all over the place. Here, 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 you get the idea. And pouring gas on that fire was, of course, the Father's Rights Movement, who handed out, or should I say, hyped out copy of this lawsuit to their 800,000 followers, like free samples at Sam's Club. And a lot of parents took that and started filing their own copycat lawsuits. And, and I hope, you know, I hope everybody will read the class action lawsuit, it's online and- A few moments later. So I've already had one copycat lawsuit and it's kind of a flattering thing that somebody would copy, but the lawsuit was designed that you could use it in any of the 50 states. Now copycatting is all well and good unless it's a loser lawsuit because then it just poisons well in their family case, not to mention the embarrassment if it gets sanctioned for filing it. Which ties into my second reason why I'm hard on this lawsuit. No prudent attorney would have filed it, and that assertion has zero to do with their unfitness legal theory. Let me explain. Certain cases can only have certain kinds of defendants. A divorce action can't name your neighbor as a defendant just because he stole your pet poodle the other day. Wrong type of defendant for that type of case. Doesn't mean you can't sue the neighbor just that you can't sue him for a divorce. For this type of 1983 action, which is a specific kind of civil rights action, the defendant must not be a state official. No exceptions. That's called a threshold issue, something you have to figure out first, otherwise the rest doesn't matter. Divorce needs a spouse. Eviction needs a tenant. 1983 action must not be a state official. So for those in the back, if the chairwoman of the California Judicial Council is considered a state official, this 1983 lawsuit is deader than Jimmy Hoffa. And spoiler alert, a 10 second LexisNexis search, that's a lawyer's Google, if you will, brings up this case, a case any mediocre lawyer would have been aware of before filing. And plain as day, it states the chairperson of the Judicial Council is treated as a state official for purposes of this type of lawsuit. In my first week of law school, I think everybody's first week of law school, uh, we're taught a fancy sounding Latin phrase, stare decisis, and it means, well, <laughs> it means the trial judge must follow the case law of the circuit. And there's only one way to get around that, an appeal. But that appeal lives or dies on what you did at the trial level. So if I was the trial attorney and these parents were to put a gun to my head and told me to file this, well, here's what I'd say to them. Hey parents, when I file, we'll be met with a motion to dismiss because there's case law stating the chair lady can't be sued in this type of case. We have to file a thorough and detailed response why that case law was wrongly decided, knowing the trial judge will be forced to rule against us. And the reason we're doing this kabuki theater is because by preserving the argument at the trial level, even though the case is gonna get thrown out, we're allowed to raise it on appeal and ask the appellate court to revisit whether case law, barring us from suing her in that type of lawsuit, needs to change. And to be clear, if we don't argue the case was wrongly decided, you're better off using the money you would have paid me 
to go see the Dresden Dolls in DC. Killer show. So if we file this, we must also budget for the appeal because without the appeal, we're just wasting time. So now that we've covered the parents' only path to victory, let's look at their response to the motion dismissed. Remember, this is their only chance to preserve the argument that the strength man decision, which is the controlling case that says they can't sue Judge Guerrero, that's the chair lady of the Judicial Council, in this 1983 action was wrongly decided. Here we see the native lawyer basking in the glow of social media attention. But lurking in the shadows was this terrible thing called reality. Here, the parents inexplicably cite to the Supreme Court's decision in Hess, a case that discusses when an entity can claim immunity from civil litigation. To understand why the parents squandered their chance to preserve the issue on appeal, one must understand the difference between a proper defendant and an affirmative defence. As a matter of fact, a reading of Strankman makes clear the issue wasn't immunity at all, but whether the Judicial Council was a proper defendant. But to placate critics, let's say they were proper. At that point, the judge could then raise a second line of defence, judicial immunity. However, the parents in their response either conflated or otherwise confused this second line of defence for the first. And this error proved fatal, not only for the trial case, but also for any appeal. For you see, courts adhere to a concept known as forfeiture. Forfeiture does not allow an appellant to correct their confusion on appeal. If this is still confusing for non-lawyers, allow me to explain by analogy by using the most rocking game ever. Mega Man 3. In Mega Man 3, the game won't let you go to Dr. Wily's castle until you first defeat his eight evil robots. Look at these eight evil robots as the threshold issue or proper defendant. And Dr. Wily's castle is that second line of defense, judicial immunity. So had the parents demonstrated Judge Guerrero was a proper defendant, they would still need to overcome her immunity as shown through this badass boss battle. Tragically, in their response, they failed to argue those distinctions, which proved to be their undoing. The truth is that parents in this case made the same mistake all of these parental rights lawsuits make. They draft up a pretty looking piece of paper first and they file it, but they don't engage in an ounce of due diligence until they're hit with the motion to dismiss. So it's no coincidence the parents put this little nugget into the paperwork. These are fancy lawyer words for... <sighs> we fucked up. Or, or better put, we failed to understand what we're doing. Can we please get a do-over? Now, I know what one of you is thinking, but David, I can still appeal and, and use my 50-50 powers to, to fix this. No, no, you can't raise new arguments for the first time on appeal. You, you can't go, hey, appellate court, we now want to argue strength and was wrongly decided. You had your chance to do that at the trial court. It's too late. Again, money better spent on seeing the Dresden Dolls. Whew. All right. It's out of my system. Let's move on to the education. David unfortunately spoke too soon. Mere days after the lawsuit imploded, social media was abuzz with promises of an appeal and, unsurprisingly, requests for money that would have been better spent seeing the Dresden Dolls. As the old adage goes, a fool and his money are soon parted. Okay, now it's really out of my system. Let's turn to the educational part. Let's say this lawsuit was super duper correct and for decades the states just got it all wrong because the lawsuit argued the standard for custody isn't best interest, it's unfitness. And recently, there was this proposed bill in the Illinois legislator that tried to sneak the standard into the statute, thereby replacing best interest as the primary factor. Sneaky, sneaky. So, is an unfitness standard even feasible in family court? No. Oh, wanted reasons. Okay. Well, the term unfit in Illinois is defined by the Adoption Act and applies to adoptions and matters pending in juvenile court. You won't see it in the family law courtroom because unfitness is tied to termination of parental rights, not what time pickup and drop off is or whether the kids are going to be doing lacrosse. So understandably, most parents and some lawyers have no clue what that term means. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Which makes what I'm about to say an M. Night Shyamalan level twist. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I'm referring to his early good work because there isn't just one basis for unfitness. There is close to 26 or so, and every other state has the same or substantially similar laundry list of things that could make a parent unfit. Unleashing unfitness is unleashing Godzilla. And it ain't this Godzilla, it's this one. Yeah. 
it is so destructive that we only bring it out when we're about to terminate rights, not only because it's draconian as all heck, but because there are so many avenues to prove a parent unfit, it blows many family law practitioners' minds because it's a legal Godzilla. Refuse to attend supervised visitation for more than 12 months, unfit. Fail to pay child support, unfit. Fail to comply with court directives such as attending counseling or anger management, unfit. Felony convictions could be unfit. Judge believes you are mentally ill, unfit. I will catch heat for saying it, but I'm gonna say it. Chances are many parents in family court would meet at least one of these unfitness criteria if we were to make that the standard because it wasn't designed for family court. But David, one of you says, can't we just fix all those troublesome terms so it plays well with family court? Very doubtful. Take for example, unfitness under section B, which is by far one of the most common ones you'll find in juvenile court. And then if we were to go abolish it, this isn't a criminal statute. We're talking about a fundamental right. Why wouldn't zillions of parents be able to petition for the return of the kid that was TPR'd under that section? Last month, last year, last decade? Because remember, even after the kid ages out, the parent still loses the right to airship in a TPR. Good luck putting that genie back in the bottle if you're thinking of softening these standards. We're talking millions of cases nationwide. It would be an ex post facto train wreck. And even if we were to find some magic formula to solve that problem, here's the nail that ends all debate. Every state, either by statute or in reference to the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which is incorporated into the state constitutions, appoint counsel when unfitness is at issue at no cost if they can't afford it, which oftentimes means a public defender because we're dealing with a fundamental right. We would need hundreds of thousands of new lawyers at taxpayer expense to accommodate the destruction this legal Godzilla would unleash. Parents can't agree on football? Well, that's a decision issue. Fundamental right. Lawyer. School, lawyer, braces, lawyer, pick up a drop off time, lawyer. There's no way to referee this once the genie's out of the bottle. Good luck convincing any state in any universe to put themselves in such a financially untenable position, which is why class actions like this were never, ever going to work. Anyways, that's all I have. We have our contempt roundup dropping in April, and right now that's looking at about 30 cases plus the mother of all cheat sheets, which I'm still working on. Oh, and if the scheduling gods are kind, I may, may have an extra cool surprise before the next video drops. Maybe, I, I don't want to overpromise at this point just yet, but if you haven't already, consider stalking this channel to get first dibs if it drops. So until next time, as always, thanks for watching. You motherfuckers, you'll see